Ubik by Philip K. Dick is a novel that explores superb philosophical ideas. In this video, I'll try to summarize the plot and to analyze it. The events take place in a futuristic world in the year 1992, but it's supposed to be the future because the novel was written in 1969. It is only 23 years into the future. Although the technological advancement and human evolution seem so massively advanced that we can only think that it must take more than 23 years to get there. I have a theory about why Philip K. Dick is saying that it's only 23 years into the future and I'll share this theory towards the end of this video because it'll make more sense then. So let's say that the story happens sometime in the not so distant future. In accordance with evolution and our humans evolved from Neanderthals and Denisovans and our humans brains have got bigger and their cognitive abilities stronger evolution will continue to have its way, to the point that the human of today will be very different from the human of the future. So in the world of the novel, there are people who have psychic abilities. Another interesting thing about the world of Yubik is that when people die, they can be maintained in a state of half-life. The body of the deceased person is cryogenically preserved. It's frozen, but their consciousness remains. They can still communicate through resuscitations, but there's only a limited number of possible resuscitations before the person completely dies. The novel follows the story of the main protagonist, Joe Chip, who works as a technician for Ronsita Associates. It's a prudence organization. Prudence organizations are a thing in the world of the novel. They're like companies that make antiviruses, except that they don't protect your computer, they protect you. They protect people and companies against psychic attacks. Ronsita Associates is one of the most famous and powerful prudence organizations in the world. There is another type of organizations that carries out psychic attacks. And Hollis is one example of those organizations. Hollis and Ronsita Associates are arch enemies. They fight each other. The head of Ronsita Associates is Glenn Ronsita. Together with his wife, they're co-owners of the organization. Glenn's wife, Ella, is in half-life. She is kept at the beloved Brethren Moratorium in Zurich. Her husband visits her to consult her on work whenever something important pops up. He knows that every time her consciousness is awoken, she gets closer to final death. But it was her wish to continue to have a say in how business is run, even after death. Glenn questions to what extent his wife is still his wife. She doesn't move, her mouth doesn't move when she talks, her body is inert and there are no facial expressions. But at the same time, her consciousness, her ideas and her memories are still the same. Glenn has asked Ella to explain to him what it feels to be in half-life. And she has said that it's like gravity stops affecting you and you float. Glenn visits his wife to consult her over some pressing work matters. A dangerous psychic named Dole Melipone that Ronsita Associates has been tracking has gone off the radar. The organization doesn't know his whereabouts. Glenn was expecting Ella to come up with some bright idea, but she doesn't know much about this Dole Melipone. Glenn fills her in and she starts to offer him counsel until her consciousness is intruded upon by the consciousness of another person in half-life. He introduces himself to Glenn as Jory. Jory is apologetic and is thirsty for conversation with somebody who is not a half-lifer, somebody from the real world. But Glenn wouldn't take any of that. He dashes out of the room and goes meet von Vogelsang, the moratorium's manager, who talks to Jory on the microphone and tells him to leave Ella alone. It appears Jory died when he was 15 and this explains his vitality. Von Vogelsang tells Glenn that Ella is weak and this makes her vulnerable to interference but that for a little more money she could be put in an isolated room without any half-lifers in proximity and Glenn agrees to do that. Things are not going well at Ronsita Associates. They're not getting many contracts. But then they throw in a lifeboat. A prominent businessman called Stanton Mick approaches the organization with the intent to have them secure some facilities of his on the moon. Stanton doesn't personally meet Glenn. It is Stanton's representative, Miss Wirt, who meets Glenn and tells him to secure some moon-based facilities against psychic attacks. She insists that they should fly immediately to the moon and start to work. Glenn tells her that he needs more time to analyze the situation and devise his work plan, but she stresses that her employer wants them to go to the moon without any delay. 
Glenn rules this haste but can't afford to lose the contract. So he gathers a team of his best inertials as they're called in the novel. Joe Chip has recruited a new employee for the organization. Her name is Pat Connolly and she has an impressive skill. She can change the past. Joe is both impressed and scared by her ability. Joe is under a lot of debts and she has promised to help him get rid of his debts. She is chosen amongst the 11 inertials who would fly to the moon. As soon as they get there, they're taken to a hotel suite. They discover that it's a trap and the whole place explodes. Glenn Ronsitter appears to be lethally wounded, but the other members of the team don't seem to be hurt. They take their boss's body and try to get back to Earth in time to have him cryogenically preserved. And on the flight back home, they start to notice some strangeness. Joe Chip is the first to experience it. He got out bent a cigarette and lit it. The cigarette, dry and stale, broke apart as he tried to hold it between his fingers. Strange, he thought. Wendy wonders whether the explosion might have caused them to age. She feels old. And from this point on, the lives of the eleven inertials and Joe Chip would spiral into uncanniness. As soon as they land on Earth, they go fast to the moratorium in Zurich. But Von Vogelsang tells them that it's too late for Glenn and that he can't be put in the state of half-life. This means that it's Joe Chip who is now in charge of the organization. And this worries Joe because he thinks he can't even manage his own life. He's all indebted. He can't manage his own expenses. He wonders how he would be able to manage as complex a firm as Ronsita Associates. The second strange event that happens is when Joe tries to make a call. The quarter he throws in the vid phone is rejected. And the vid phone tells Joe that it doesn't accept old money. Joe checks the coin and it truly appears to be old. Old Hammond suggests Joe go to a hotel to rest and be joined by Wendy. Joe resists the idea at first but he later accepts. Then Joe tells Old Hammond that all their money is obsolete and worthless. All empties his pocket and purse and finds that some of his bills are old but still usable. Joe takes those bills and tells all that he'll pay him back because he'll be the head of the organization. Joe even starts to think about how he'll get out of his financial troubles and how efficiently he'll run Ronsita Associates. Joe spends the night at the hotel and the first thing he does in the morning is call room service. But much to his astonishment, what he hears on the phone is the voice of Glenn Ronsitter. Then somebody starts to knock on the door. It's Von Vogelsang, the owner of the moratorium, who tells Joe that he's been trying to phone him all night long and Joe was unreachable. But for Joe, he didn't hear any phone ringing. Joe borrows some more money from Von Vogelsang and tells him that he'll be flying to New York to meet with the other inertials who have survived the attack. But according to Von Vogelsang, Wendy is not in New York. She has joined Joe in his hotel room, although Joe doesn't have any recollection of that. Von Vogelsang starts to search the room. He opens a closet and finds Wendy's dead body. The corpse is dried out. It is as if it's been dead for a long time. Joe starts to link the stale cigarettes, the old money, and Wendy herself has said that she felt she was aging after the explosion. There must be something eerie going on, Joe thinks. He also thinks that Wendy might have died due to inhaling cobalt particles from the explosion. Joe flies to New York to meet with the employees at the organization's offices. It turns out all the survivors of the attack are experiencing strange occurrences. The food they buy is already stale, their money is obsolete and now money has the picture of Glenn Ronsitter on it. Joe and all decide to go to Baltimore where they might be able to exchange some of their old money for usable money and they manage to do so. Their trip to Baltimore and back to New York is punctuated by reality shattering events that consist of interaction with objects that are older than they should be. Then Ol and Joe stumble upon a message from Glenn Ronsitter in a bathroom. The message says that Glenn Ronsitter did not die in the explosion, that they died and that they are in the state of half-life. They don't know what to make of the message. 
Back to the conference room, which is now empty, the telly is on and it's broadcasting Glenn's funeral. The presenter talks to members of Ron Sitter Associates who pay tribute to Glenn. Joe switches a television off, then it switches itself on, and it shows Glenn Ron Sitter talking about a product called Ubik and how efficient it is against temporal degradation. Joe is baffled by his boss's appearance on television and his words, which seem to contradict the message in the bathroom, because according to that message, Glenn was alive, and now Glenn is saying that he is dead and that he died in the explosion. Joe's reality is constructed of layers of simulacra that pile up on each other. He has witnessed enough fractures of reality that he cannot tell what is real and what is not. Joe engages in a constant construction and deconstruction of hyperrealities as they are described by philosopher John Baudrillard. In postmodernism, Baudrillard and other philosophers describe hyperreality as the incapacity to access any real reality reality, either because the world is rife with conflicting ideas that spread through images, through stories, through gadgets and commodities, or because we as humans are incapable of accessing any reality, or because there is no objective reality in a world to begin with. Hence, we all live in hyper-realities. Our ideals, our beliefs, our convictions can theoretically all be deconstructed. Back to the story, Glenn talks to Joe through television and commands him to go back home where he would find some ubik that he would have to use, otherwise he will die. And this is what Joe does, he goes back home. Time continues to regress. When Joe gets home, he checks his post box. He finds some medicaments that are labelled ubik, but they're not like the spray he's seen advertised. Joe decides he would have to go to Des Moines where the supposed burial of Glenn would take place. Everything around Joe keeps regressing, even his car turns into an older car. He boards on an airplane and flies to Des Moines, but is a little too late and he misses Glenn's burial. It's now 1939. Joe meets up with his co-workers at the burial site and they all drive back to the hotel. Joe thinks to himself that it cannot be 1939. The graffiti on the bathroom must have been right. They might be in half-life. But he doesn't want to tell his co-workers because he thinks it's better for them to find out by themselves. He keeps driving until he is pulled over by a police officer who hands him a ticket. And before Joe puts the ticket in his pocket, he glances at it and it reads, You are in much greater danger than I already thought. What Pat Conley said is, and the message ends there. Yeah. Joe would find the rest of the message at the label of a ubic powder tin he gets at a drugstore, and the message says that what Pat Connolly said is not true. The message warns Joe against Pat and ends up with brazen ubic and its healing powers. Joe can't afford to buy the ubic powder because it's too expensive and because his money is worthless. He goes to the hotel and meets with Don Denny, who tells him that more of their colleagues are disappearing. Joe shows Don the ticket and the message on it. This shocks Don, but they both agree not to tell their colleagues. Pat surprises them peeking at the message, and she reads the inscription about her. Joe confronts her by telling her that she is behind everything that has happened. She doesn't deny any of it, she just smiles, and the hotel lobby explodes. Joe is very weakened by the explosion. Pat offers to help him get to a room where he can rest, and he asks her directly whether she works for Hollis, and whether she orchestrated the whole hit on the organ organization to kill Glenn and his team of talented workers, and she confesses by saying, quite right. She leaves him at the door of room 203, thinking that he'll soon die. He manages to open the door, and much to his amazement, he sees Glenn Ronsitter, who helps him get into the room and be seated on the chair Glenn has been sitting on. Then Glenn sprays Joe with some ubik, which immediately invigorates him and makes him feel better. Glenn tells Joe that the effect of ubik is fantastic, but temporary. Joe's life is dependent on acquiring Ubik. Then Glenn confirms the message about Pat's betrayal. Joe starts to question Glenn's version of what is happening. 
He wonders why Hollis wouldn't content with just killing them, and why time has to keep regressing. Joe asks Glenn whether he's sure he's not dead, because in Joe's reality, Glenn's body has been sitting in a casket and eventually buried. Joe says that the only thing that is certain is that they're in a strange situation and that there are two forces, one that tries to destroy them and another that tries to help them by giving them Yubik. Glenn confesses that he doesn't have all the answers, but he's sure that he's alive and his team are in half-life. Then Glenn's conversation with Joe ends, and Glenn appears to be in the moratorium, where he tells von Vogelsang that he has finished talking with Joe. Joe is visited by Don Denny, who finds him in a much better shape, and Joe tells Don Denny about his encounter with Glenn and the effect of Ubik. Joe has Don spray himself with what's left of Ubik, but as soon as he does that, Don disappears and is replaced by Jory, the 15-year-old boy who used to invade Ella Ronsitter's consciousness. Jory, the generator of illusions, bears a lot of resemblance with Descartes' evil genius, the strong vicious spirit that creates illusions and fans doubt. Joe pounces at Jory, wanting to kill him, but it's Jory who has the upper hand in the fight and he tries to eat Joe. He can't because Joe is still empowered by Yubik. The thing with Yubik though is that its effect will end up wearing off. Joe's only defense against being eaten by Jory is getting some more Yubik sprays. Jory leaves. Joe gets out of the hotel and takes a cab to a restaurant. And while in the cab, he spots a beautiful young girl. He asks a driver to stop and asks the girl to go with him to the restaurant. The effects of Yubik have already started to dissipate. The girl is agreeable, she hops into the cab and she accepts to accompany Joe to the restaurant. Then she hands him a piece of paper. Joe checks it and it appears to be a certificate that entitles Joe to unlimited supplies of Yubik. The girl reveals herself to be Ella Ronsita. She also tells him that she will no longer be in half-life and that she will be reborn out of a new womb. Ella knows that she will be dead for good soon and she thinks that it is reincarnation that awaits dead people. Joe goes to a pharmacy to claim his free Ubik, the Ubik his certificate entitles him to. But it would turn out the pharmacist is Jory and he has turned all the Ubik there into useless meds. Jory promises not to let Joe get any Ubik from any pharmacy, but Joe is defiant and he gets out of the pharmacy. As soon as he does, he is accosted by a woman who tells him that she works for Glen Ronsita and she hands him some Ubik sprays. Glenn Ronsita is at the moratorium. He asks to talk to his wife. An employee there brings him a casket. Glenn takes a handful of 50 cents and hands them to the employee. They both check them and they're both surprised to discover that there is the picture of Joe Chip on the coins. No definitive answer is given, but this could very well mean that Glenn Ronsita is in Half-Life too and that all there is is hyperreality. There is another indication that Glenn and everybody in the novel have always been in Half-Life since even before the beginning of the novel. The events supposedly take place in 1992 and the novel was written in 1969. Yet, the technological advancement and human evolution are too advanced. All this evolution must have taken more than 23 years. Maybe the fact that Philip K. Dick is saying that it's only 23 years into the future indicates that all the characters in the novel have always been in Half-Life and that time is regressing and that this is why it's only 1992. What does Yubik symbolize? In the last chapter of the novel, Yubik is described as the building block of the universe. Throughout the novel, Yubik is advertised as all sorts of products. It is Yubik that helps Half-Life is against vanishing. Let's try to make sense of all of that. The novel is full of references to postmodernism, and a lot of postmodern philosophers like Lyotard, Baudrillard and Derrida deconstructed all types of beliefs and systems. People used to define themselves by their religion religions, their ethnicities, their races and their languages. But postmodernism deconstructed and destroyed those institutions by stripping them of any inherent realities. All those institutions are not built in any reality, they're just constructed by groups of powerful people and all those institutions can theoretically be deconstructed. 
Then what about the need to be something or to belong to something? People start to seek identity in what they own. The deconstruction of religious, racial and ethnic groups made people define who they are through the commodities they own. Commodities are no longer bought for their usefulness, but they're bought for the message they communicate about the person who owns them. When a person buys a Rolex, it's not because they want to know the time. It's because they want to be recognized as a person who can afford to buy such an expensive commodity and to integrate the group of people who can afford to buy such a commodity. Why isn't the effect of your big permanent? It is because this is how commodities work. You don't buy a product that associates you with an upper social class once and for all. New high-end phones, cars or watches are constantly manufactured and you are urged to keep upgrading and keep buying to keep being identified with the social class or the group you want to be identified with. I think this explains why the effect of Ubik is only temporary and you have to keep buying Ubik and spraying yourself with it, otherwise you vanish. Now this video has reached its end, until we meet again, have a great day.